Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Incredible India. As the topic suggests, yes, uh, we, we, we come and we represent a country which is amazing, which is incredible. And what's really happening to football is even more intriguing. Uh, what we are trying to bring to you today is a very, very specific agenda. It's a very, very specific exercise where we are trying to provide enough clarity about the larger opportunities that are uh, emerging thanks to the demography, thanks to uh, the, the structures that are getting redefined on the league level, on the grassroots level, on the competition level, but also try to highlight certain challenges which are very, very unique to this market. I keep on believing that the opportunities that are uh, existing certainly are unique, but more so the challenges also. So, so to do that, we have a group of experts, again from various domains, who will try to share their thoughts on one, this big opportunity called Incredible India, and also why we believe the time is right, and it's right now. Uh, also, let me try to highlight the fact that uh, we have been bringing a delegation from India for last five years. This is the fifth time we put together a delegation of 25 representatives from various walks and various do domains in football in India. And uh, this essentially was initiated to get a lot of networking, a lot of information exchange going on for the industry that we are build, uh, trying to build back in India. And this delegation this year includes uh, stakeholders right from the Government of India, the Chamber of Commerce, the All India Football Federation. Uh, we've got uh, uh, people representing certain agencies and law firms. Plus, we've got uh, uh, two ISL clubs, Indian Super League clubs, who are there uh, trying to kind of share their thoughts on what's happening back in uh, India. Uh, so quickly, let me introduce you, uh, the panel, and uh, also give a little background in terms of their association football and then quickly try to get into uh, an exercise we'll, where we'll try to get certain insights. Uh, on to my left, Peter. Uh, we are trying to make him Indian, by the way. But yeah, <laughs> you, you, you all know Peter, a fantastic you know, uh, you know, uh, a set of energies, expertise that obviously he's known for. But Peter ended up spending one season yes. with Indian football, Indian so uh, Super League yes. clubs, Mumbai City FC. Uh, we're going to come back to you, Peter, to get to know a little more about your experiences, but particularly what, what uh, larger <coughs> opportunities are kind of in the waiting and how it needs to be leveraged. Uh, on to left of Peter, we have Mr. Kushal Das. And I keep on repeating again and again that Kushal was pretty much one indication in 2009-2010 where AIFF seriously went out and said we want to change, we want to prof professionalize the setup. And that's where an executive who has a very strong professional background was brought into the system and since then, Mr. Das, we've seen very, very big changes and what we are looking at now, again, are, are certain situations which we had never kind of envisioned but still, uh, we, we find a lot of opportunities which uh, we would want you to kind of highlight a little more. <coughs> On the left of uh, Mr. Das, uh, we have Mr. Rajpal Singh. Uh, he's the voice of the industry. He is the director of sports for Federation of Indian uh, Chamber of Commerce and Industry. Pretty much a chamber of commerce which then picked up the cause of the sports industry and in particular football. And uh, what we would like to understand from uh, Rajpal in this session is his point of view in terms of what is the industry demanding, not only from a national perspective back in India, but also from a global perspective. So we're gonna pick up uh, some some uh, uh, <coughs> thoughts from, from Rajpal. On to, on to the far left, we have uh, Mr. Rahul Patil. He is the CEO of a very unique initiative uh, called Northeast United Football Club, which is pretty much owned by one of very popular Bollywood actors, uh, John Abraham. Now, Northeast is pretty much a region which is the hotbed of talent in the country. It has certainly provided a lot of uh, players to the national team and all the, all the clubs that exist in the country. And that is where, uh, rather than just picking up a city or a state, uh, Northeast United said we'll go out and target a region which has eight different states. Uh, yes, there, there, are, uh, there, 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 there is a deep understanding that these states are very different, but then the idea is to unify that particular region and uh, go out and create a brand out of it. Uh, so quickly, I would like to start off uh, with, with Mr. Das, just to really understand <coughs> at a federation level, uh, when we are talking about Incredible India and the opportunities that are existing and the time being now, uh, so the larger two things that come to our mind right now is pretty much the success of Indian Super League and how we are going into the second season in October. 
uh, there's a great bit of debate that's kind of happening. Uh, so India is a very unique case where we have two leagues that are going on. And uh, would there be coexist coexistence or would there be any other solution that comes out which then will help the country to move forward? So uh, Indian Super League uh, is certainly something that uh, has brought in a lot of uh, interest in, in our market. And particularly the under 17 World Cup that is going to take place in 2017. So are these the two big ones that you're looking at? And if yes, what are the larger opportunities and challenges if, if you can uh, touch upon them? Uh, yes, most certainly. These are the two big opportunities. Uh, I think the approach of the Federation was a top-down approach for, with the ISL, the Indian Super League, as well as a bottoms-up approach with the Under-17 World Cup and youth development. So we think that these are huge game changers. The ISL in its first year was a big success, I would think, uh, in terms of visibility, in terms of spectator attendance. The fourth highest attended uh, league in the world, which is a great achievement. Uh, going forward, of course, we, we think the ISL will be much more competitive, uh, will have more uh, players of, uh, you know, better players and players with uh, greater reputation and uh, greater fitness levels, I would think. So we, we expect the ISL to move forward and help in creating that buzz and visibility for Indian football. You're right, there are two leagues. That, that is, uh, well, it's not a, I think it's a pretty good problem to have right now. Because if you look at it, we have 11 clubs playing the National League and eight clubs playing the ISL. So that's a total of 19 clubs. The investment in Indian soccer or Indian football, if it was X a couple of years back, is now 4X. So that's a, that's a huge uh, increase. And there is definite traction there in terms of uh, the buzz and the visibility of Indian football. But at the same time, we need to find a solution going forward about two leagues. It is a difficult solution, but as I said, probably not a, it's probably a good problem to have. And uh, we are in talks with various stakeholders to try and find a solution. As regards the Under-17 World Cup, I think again, that is going, that's going to be a huge game changer. We have started the preparations in earnest, right earnest. The team is preparing in Germany right now, and they've been doing pretty well, actually. They've been playing some very good teams, and uh, they've done quite well. We have uh, more plans for them. Uh, I think they would have to spend most of their time in Europe. Uh, in fact, I'll just give you a piece of information. I'm in talks with the, with the German Football Association uh, for the team to participate in one of the German leagues, the youth leagues. And if that comes through, I think that would be great preparation for the team. Uh, we're also preparing the, the venues, etc., for the Under-17 World Cup, uh, because we need to deliver an event which is up to FIFA standards, so we are, we are very cognizant of that fact. And at the same time, what we're trying to do is also create a buzz around the Under-17 World Cup. Uh, we're starting a project called Mission 11 Million, which is essentially to engage at least 11 million youth, children, kids, uh, leading up to the Under-17 World Cup, uh, create that buzz about football in India, and have a kind of a engagement uh, policy where not only do they come and see the games or participate there, but also in various forms like designing the city logo, etc. So it's a two-pronged approach, as I mentioned, and I think there are exciting times and. I think the giant has woken up. Certainly, uh, Mr. Das. I think uh, it goes back to 2005 to, to 2006 when uh, Mr. Sablata himself kind of made the statement very, very popular, uh, where, where he did mention that uh, India is a sleeping giant and needs to be woken up. And I think it started beginning to stir. And, and uh, again, uh, Mr. Das, my experience in the last four years uh, is also that, uh, you know, the Federation is not alone in these initiatives. And, and somewhere or the other, even if you look at uh, the, the uh, Ministry of Sports, even if you look at the government of India, and then their interest, uh, and thanks again to un the Under-17 World Cup initiative, is this kind of becoming more and more stronger. So much so that we have a representation uh, from the government of India and the sports ministry right here in, in, in this room. And also there are uh, very in in interesting state initiatives. India is a huge country. We call it a group of 29 countries fitted into one country. Uh, where, where even a even a, a, a state like Goa, which is, which might be bigger than a lot of these European countries, 
uh, is is having an initiative called uh, Goa Football Development Council. We have representation from GFDC right here, where by a state went out and allocated resources, allocated uh, some bit of uh, organization to go out and progress the game at, at, at the state level. Uh, which which certainly brings me to uh, Mr. <coughs> Mr. Rajpal Singh, who again represents the industry, certainly knows what they are talking about, also is aware of, of the immense uh, latent and potential investment which is pretty much sitting on uh, the fence somewhere, pretty much sitting on the sidelines, waiting to kind of jump in. But I don't know what's going to give them that kind of confidence to go out and say, the time is now. If I need to do it, I need to do it now. So Rajpalji, your thoughts on what, what the industry is kind of looking at from fr football uh, uh, in particular? Uh, you know, Sukri, I mean, you have just mentioned about this. Uh, you know, as of now, uh, or in fact, uh, if you see it off late, uh, till off late, uh, there used to be like sports used to be considered as extracurricular activities. Nobody thought about the main stream industry. And that was the time when FICCI, Federation of Indian Chamber of Commerce, thought that in, this is also one of the industry which need to be recognized in terms of like any other industry. And that is why we have started working on uh, sports. Uh, what we want from the industry side is the recognition of industry from the government side. And secondly, what industry wants before investing in this is the transparency. Transparency, accountability, and sustainability. Because these are the, uh, some of the things which are very, very important for the industry. As of now, there are you know, federations and also state level uh, bodies which are doing it. But they are doing it for as CSR or you know as uh, extracurricular activities. In uh, India, uh, sports is not a very organized sector as of now, and that exactly like last three four years, what government of India has also started recognizing, and that is the reason why, in fact, uh, in the last uh, year, uh, you know, government has suggested that CSR activity you know, in the industry, and it is a mandatory now that 2% of total uh, profit should be invested in CSR. And sport is mentioned at two places, one as a skill development and second as a sports per se uh, coaching. So this is, uh, these are some of the things what I feel industry is needed and is requiring and government is working on it. Right. Yeah. So Raj, uh, uh, Mr. Singh, we are, we are looking at a very interesting situation. One, on one side you are trying to corporatize professionalized, even the clubs are supposed to be commercial entities who are, who are playing in the league. So you are actually trying to uh, make the industry look at it as more of a viable return on investment or maybe a long-term investment kind of project which gives you the right kind of returns back. And on the other hand, you are kind of hanging in this carrot of, of a CSR, going out and saying, our government obviously has gone out and made it mandatory for the companies to uh, allocate 2% of their profits to CSR. And sports and football are, are, is, is mentioned somewhere. Yes. So on, on one side is the professionalization of it. On the other side, you are actually going out and saying, still look at CSR, still look at it as you know more of a uh, non kind of commercial or non ROI related uh, venture. So is it, is, it, is, it, is it kind of consistent or do you think it's, it's contradictory? In, in no, case? actually I would say it's a very consistent and what we are uh, talking about, if it is a good for the, in the, uh, good for the in, uh, country as a whole, it is good for the industry. And that is one of the reasons where we are talking about CSR for the grassroots level, for the coaching level, which are not so profitable as of now. And elite sports, definitely, I mean, lots of companies are coming, lots of, uh, the, you know, federations are working on it. Government of India is allocating separate uh, money for elite sports. Now, uh, ISL and all, you know, leagues are coming up, clubs are coming up. So they, are, they would be looking after the, apart from, you know, uh, elite sports will be there, but definitely they are also doing some work in the grassroots level. But we are more focusing what we see from expectation from their side is the elite sports and CSR side is uh, the grassroots level. Certainly. Uh, Peter, can I get you in? <coughs> uh, your experiences with Mumbai City FC, not only as a club really, mm -hmm. which, which played a two and a half month uh, league nice. slash tournament, but uh, even your, your experiences when you were kind of traveling around, also knowing that you have a strong uh, uh, you know, Asian kind of connection thanks to your 
uh, uh, project in uh, Thailand, yeah. uh, for that matter. So, what what is a reasonable sense? Uh, because you are pretty much on this panel, uh, the the only person who's looking at India from an outside perspective. So, what what's been your experience in general? Well, the opportunities and the challenges. My my first um, experience of it. Well, no first ex was speaking to a lad called Steve Constantine when I was doing my U UEFA Pro license. And he was saying the National League, he said, sometimes the gates will be 80,000 people watching a game. And I thought, are you crackers? 80,000 people? Because I know from being a sportsman and cricket mad, I thought Indian, uh, Indian was just cricket. And Mumbai was just cricket. But to my great surprise, football is massive in India. Absolutely massive. One of the things from a coach's point of view, which... We all agreed, having a chat before, the infrastructure has got to be there because of the climates, the monsoons, it's very difficult with the grass pitches to get the kids coaching the facilities for them. <clears throat> the standard was excellent. The organisation in the Super League last year was tremendous. The one thing was the infrastructure, which I'm led to believe with the Under-70s World Cup is going to improve. And once it improves, the interest in football, the enthusiasm among the children, the grassroots. I went to a couple of academies, uh, charity-based, with a, a priest who was running one in Mumbai. There's 1,500 children there, girls and boys, and it took me breath away. And they were, they were playing on sand-based pitches, which weren't clever, even I couldn't pass on them. The kids were fantastic work, and, and the enthusiasm was amazing. So this, and when you, it's an understatement when you're saying uh, it's, it's sleeping giant. It's, India is massive. And the interest in football amazed me. And I've been Australia, South America, Japan. I've been all over the world involved in football, playing and coaching. And the interest in India among the children playing, going down on the beach, shirts, I mean English shirts, Spanish, Barcelona, Real Madrid, kids playing on the beach amaze me. So this, this country is a sleeping giant and it, the interest is massive and I'm sure North East, they, they live and breathe football. It's like, it's like my own town, Liverpool. It's amazing and it will get there, it will improve. The, the Super League, I think six Indian players have got to be in any yeah. given side, which I think is a great idea. So in training, working with the professionals and the marquee players who are coming over, there's an improvement all the time. And I just think it's going to go from strength to strength. And once the infrastructure there, it's going to take off. Sure. I mean, again, adding on to what uh, Peter said about the country and the population <coughs> and the young kids, I think uh, it's not only a sleeping giant, but it's a very young giant. Mm. It's going to grow. Uh, if you look at well, the, the gates, the gates for the Indian Super League last year were the fourth best in the world behind the Premier League, Bundesliga, La Liga, and then the Indian Super League come next. That amazed me, and it, there was only eight teams in it. It was fantastic, and it's going. To, it's only going to get bigger. And some data point. I mean, uh, India has 500 million uh, uh, population, which is under the age of 25. And what are these kids doing really? They're, they're playing cricket, they're following cricket, they're playing Formula One, as in they're, they're following Formula One. Playing, uh, playing Formula One, that's <laughs> good. <laughs> sorry, <laughs> sorry. Uh, yeah, so they're, they're kind of uh, really following a lot of other non cricketing sport. And amongst these non cricketing sport, uh, football pretty much acquires a very interesting position. Well, you no, come so out with the figures, didn't you, before, the Ralph? Figures that have come out are that age group of seven to the age group of 35, actually. 76% of the Indian population is now following and playing football. So cricket's taking a back step slowly and the sponsors also from, from a club perspective, uh, that's where the concentration is going on is for the youth. Sure, yeah. and even your, uh, uh, the city where you operate from, uh, Mumbai, and where, where uh, Peter worked, uh, uh, they, they have a school tournament, a school league really, uh, called MSSA, and where there are 526 school teams that participate year on year. So these are certain data points which are exciting. But also, Peter, let me kind of get your, your point of view on this. Uh, again, our friends sitting from uh, you know uh, various parts of uh, the globe. Again, a lot of interactions happening with uh, you know certain uh, 
you know, uh, people from global uh, football coming into India. It's not very organized. Uh, a couple of trips to Delhi and a Bombay, and there's a bit of disillusionment. It doesn't move uh, very fast. Uh, things are a little difficult. So w what what would be your advice? We, we, it's certainly, it's a unique country. It's a different country. It's, it's not really you know uh, as structured as uh, even even an Asian country like a Japan. So what would be your piece of uh, see? Ultimately, there are opportunities out there, but it, it's also a different kind of ball game altogether, which requires patience, which requires a little bit of different <coughs> approach. You just said before it's a young, young, and you've got to start somewhere. So it's just getting the structure in place. And I mean, I, th I think the northeast, like you said before, they are football crackers. I mean, so they're getting there. You, you, you go up there, and the, the media interest is amazing. I couldn't believe the, the press conferences. But you've got to start somewhere. You get a structure. A great start is an under-17 World Cup. That that is fantastic, and you build on it. But you've got to start from there and work up and get that structure in place. National team, obviously, National League. You're on about the two leagues. I, th I think in, in time, they will come together. Uh, I think that will, will be a fact. And once, once the organisation's in place, and it takes time. I mean, don't forget England started. We started in the 1800s, you know, so it takes time. But it's, a fast, it's fast moving. And with the interest, some of the owners, uh, some of the movie stars, Sachin Tendulkar, who is God in India, he's one of the owners there. So it's, the interest is only going to go, but you need to get the structure right, the infrastructure in terms of training facilities, coaching facilities. It takes time, it takes money. The will's there, the enthusiasm's there, and it will happen. Sure. Uh, uh, Rahul, uh, again, a very unique project in that sense. You're not really representing a city. You went out and said, this is the region which contributed to Indian football. Uh, yes, it, it's again not a region where there's a lot of industry, where there's a lot of corporate. It's a little cut out, if, if, we can, if I can use that term. So what really prompted you, uh, sitting in Bombay, to go out and say, that's the region I need to contribute? And well, primarily, there were two reasons. One is obviously, all the eight states uh, have produced the best footballers uh, yeah. at least India has ever seen over the last 50 odd years. There are only two things that work in the Northeast. Uh, one is football, second is music, that rock music to be precise. Uh, keeping, keeping in mind the hotbed of the talent that is, uh, we made this decision to invest in the Northeast and to take a franchise from there. Uh, because the kind of supply of the youth that we get in from there, and, and the idea is, you know, we've always had a vision where we've made public announcements as, uh, we don't want to end up, you know, I mean, we all want to win the league. That's all good. But in the longer run, we want to be a feeder club. And we're trying to work the model like Southampton is doing that. And I have, I have access to that talent that's based out of the Northeast, which is readily available. Uh, just as an example, what we do as a year-round program, <laughs> on a weekly basis, we have 40 coaching camps, 20 festivals, then we have uh, grassroots leagues that's under seven, under nines, under 12s, under 14s, and under 16s coming into play. And the last fact and the most important for us also is our fans. Uh, I mean, the day I opened, the first season we opened our ticket sales, within the first four days I was sold out with a capacity of 35,000 for all my seven home games. In fact, uh, this was a, I mean, we didn't envisage this uh, we came last, last season, but we're opening up sales in the next two days, I believe, and we already have a maximum sellout already in place. <laughs> it's just our fans who've supported us so well all through and through. If not for anybody else, for them, and that's the region, and that's what Northeast brings to us, and sponsors love it. And interesting, interestingly, when Northeast United played their away game at Delhi, it seemed like it was their home game. Home game, yeah. So, one interesting. Uh, so we have the largest traveling fan base also. Right, traveling plus you know uh, fans, uh, yeah. uh, northeasterns yeah. who are spread all across the country it's and the they're same, passionate. Same in Mumbai. When same we in Mumbai. In Mumbai. Yeah. 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 Same in Mumbai. Yeah, the, the northeast crowd is, is just an area there. I couldn't believe it. I think yeah, what's, the distance, was, uh, what's the distance between Mumbai and the northeast? Yeah. What is, what's the distance in miles? Oh, it's a <laughs> miles. I don't know. It's a three and a half hour flight which I have to take every week. So. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. Amazing. So I, I don't know the well, we, we, we ran out and uh, and then North East ran out and there was a bit bigger cheer than there was for the home yeah. side. Right. They were fanatics. So yeah. <coughs> and and, and I, th I, think, I think the ultimate is, is to improve the Indian players that, that's got it and, and the grassroots and, and they will become a, a player who will play in Europe yeah. uh, from India soon it will happen and then then watch it grow because it's just waiting for that and it will happen sooner rather than later I hope but once that happens the floodgates will open. So Rahul tell me I mean we, we spoke about the limitation of Northeast as, as a region which doesn't have a lot of industry participation corporate it's a little cut out in, in a very direct sense uh, what essentially would be your plan around commercialization monetization sponsorships for that matter it's it's a it's a different challenge or I understand the number of kind of but these numbers are they going to translate into sustainability figures, yes uh, I mean I'm proud to say I mean we are the only guys who sold us sponsorships for next two years already uh, this ISL what ISL has done has given given a platform for all the big sponsors uh, they've been trying to target the Northeast quite a bit but they've not been able to find the right platform where they can reach out uh, and that's where it, this, the platform actually helped, where this was one singular place where they can actually showcase themselves to the region. And uh, HTC is my lead sponsor. And I'll just give you an example. Last year, they got on board. Uh, this year around, in fact, I was speaking to the head of sales there. Because of that sponsorship, the direct monetary value that came back was their sales jumped up 286%. Now, this is huge for a market like, and in India, you know, we have phones that cost 1P and they'll go all the way up to $1,000, doesn't matter. But for that kind of market and for HTC to do so well there, this is one of the examples that we got on board, which excited them on to obviously tie up for the future next two, three years also. Sure, and I think the story would be very different for a Mumbai and a Delhi, which yeah. are pretty much part of the metros, or Kerala, which again, you know, <coughs> no. didn't have any kind of I league presence, and suddenly you have uh, a Kerala team coming in and 60,000 people, if I'm not mistaken, yeah. uh, coming in. So I think uh, 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 what you've been able to do is create some out of the box kind of solutions for yourself. But again, if you look at the other regions, uh, the, the other clubs, uh, the other projects, I think, again, it has a lot to offer, uh, provided again, as, as Peter said, it needs time, it needs a little bit of investment, and you've got to be there. You, you cannot re remote control your projects in India. That, that's it's one it's given fact. It's gonna be a 10, 15 year project for sure. Certainly. Uh, Mr. Das, again, uh, coming back to uh, uh, the under 17 World Cup in particular, what are your larger expectations really? Do you, I mean, you know, if, even if you have to list out, let's say three key takeaways, be it infrastructure, be it, uh, you know, adding to the culture that kind of exists, but needs to be kind of harnessed a little better. What, what are the top, top three, four kind of Well, infrastructure. Factors? For certain, mm -hmm. that is, I think, uh, a key thing which needs to be developed, as Peter very rightly said. And I think uh, what the Under-17 World Cup will enable is this creation of infrastructure. We need to have four training fields floodlit with dressing room facilities in each of the venues. So that's 24 training, good training fields straight away. Uh, we, of course, need to improve the stadiums. Uh, and al already the work has started in, in Calcutta, for example, the artificial turf has been removed and a natural grass pitch has been installed. Uh, so infrastructure, of course, is, is one of the key factors which, uh, you know, which we think will be developed. Uh, the other factor which I said was the preparation, the, the competitiveness of the team. Uh, we would like to create a very competitive team. And as Peter said, you know, the first players playing in Europe, I think it will come from this under-17 team. Fantastic. And that is probably going to be, you know, the floodgates can then open. We uh, already have one women player playing, right? <laughs> yeah. right. West Ham, so there she's uh, sitting right there. Oh. All right. Aditi <laughs> Chauhan, why don't you get up? That's Aditi Chauhan for you, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, who uh, very recently signed up with West Ham United uh, Ladies FC. Uh -huh. And before any guy could do it, Thank you, Aditi, for coming over. Before any guy could do it, uh, there's a girl who's go gone out. And that also brings me to the ranking of the Indian national team, uh, uh, women's national team, which is a lot better than the Indian national men's team. We are 54th, uh, if, if I'm 56th right now, uh, the women's team. And uh, 
I suddenly don't want to talk don't, about don't, my, don't, my don't, men's don't, team don't, ranking don't, as don't, of now. Don't, Maybe don't. Give, give me a couple of years. Uh, <laughs> but but uh, yeah, Mr. Das, so I think uh, somewhere or the other, uh, the under-17 uh, World Cup bringing in that bit of infrastructure push, uh, but somewhere or the that bit of attention that you're talking about uh, that, that the country gets, which can translate into a young Indian boy going out and playing at a Yeah, game. I strongly believe that uh, this, so I've seen some of the players and I've seen some of their games recently. And I can tell you for sure that I haven't seen a national team of any age group which has so much agility and fitness. You know, in terms of fitness and agility, they were right up there. They have to improve their skills, but I think uh, the, the future looks very bright. And if you can actually play in the German league, in any of the German leagues, youth leagues, I think it will be a wonderful preparation. So we expect that to happen. And of course, we going forward, we would be bidding for the Under-20 World Cup. It's a natural progression. Uh, and of course, thirdly, as I said, Mission 11 million is our attempt to engage more of the youth of India into football. And that, we hope, will again be a huge game changer. How long has the Under-17 squad been together in India? Well, they have been there for about a year. Right. They were in an academy in Goa. Uh, then we've got a new coach now for the under-17 team, he's, he's German, Nikolai Adam. And for the last one and a half months, they've been in an academy in Germany, uh, in, in Bavaria, uh, DFI. They've been playing a lot of Bundesliga teams. They, in fact, played with uh, Red Bull Salzburg. Right. Yeah, and they lost 3-2. And so it was a very, very encouraging result. So, so you know, there, there is, there is uh, a lot of optimism in the development of so this there's, team. So there's some good players, do you think, who, from that, that group who could play in Europe? I would think so. Everton. <laughs> Everton. <laughs> get Everton sorted out and we're happy about that. No, I completely share uh, Mr. Das's op optimism and it's not only me. There are people coming together, there are organizations coming together. And that's the reason, even if you look at what Fiki does uh, with, with, a, with our own football conference back in New Delhi, uh, it's been growing. And uh, we, we uh, are looking at uh, February 2016, when again, you know, we are trying to bring in the stakeholders of Indian football within India, where uh, there was some bit of disconnect, there was some bit of fragment, fragmented structure, but it's, it's taking shape. We are taking a lot of inspiration from these kind of events and trying to set it up back in India. So Rajpal, a couple of things. One is uh, the plan uh, for, for the 2016 edition of Goal, Fiki Goal. And also a little bit about, everybody spoke about the commercial side of it, the technical side of it. There's a huge, huge need of professionals. There's a huge, huge need of coaches, referees, uh, you know, talent all across uh, uh, various domains in football. You are trying to do something about it with sector skill development. So yes. talk us through a little more on that. Look, I have been talking about in you know last three four years at Soccer X. We have been mentioning about numbers, the kind of expert we need. But I am very happy to announce here that uh, sector skill council is now already set up. Government of India has already given recognition, and now we are working on uh, you know developing uh, talent. If I tell you about, uh, you know, overall sports and then on football, overall sports, we need 4.3 ex million experts in, you know, different uh, subsectors. Sports and science sector, we need 24%. Uh, Medicine, we need 10%. Uh, uh, broadcasting, grassroots, facilities, management, development, event management, coaching and manufacturing. You know, if I m highlight, uh, until few years back, we used to only focus about the coaches. But role of coaches is very, very critical. We do understand. But let me tell you, until unless we have a complete uh, ecosystem of sports, it can't uh, success, you know, succeed beyond the point. And that exactly is the point. You know, we have a fan following. Football is one of the most played sports, even more than cricket, I can say this. But at the same time, the career opportunity within sports is hardly any. I mean, once you have started something and you have not reached to an elite level, you are nowhere. You don't know what you will be doing. So this is exactly what Sector Skill Council will be uh, taking care. And that exactly these numbers are coming up. If I tell you about something about football, just in football, and these are very uh, conservative figures, what we have taken from this. 
we need 125,000 coaches in next five years, 113,000 trainers, 34,000 track and field experts, 25,000 psychologists, 56,000 sports medicine experts, 50,000 sports nutrition experts. These are just for football. I mean, these are the figures which we have uh, calculated on the basis of FIFA uh, you know, numbers given uh, uh, about India. So these are the kind of experts we need, and we believe that once, because of the now sector skill council is in place, we can create these numbers, and which will create also the job opportunity and career opportunity, and people will start working on you know uh, sports, seeing as not just as going to the elite, but also seeing as a uh, career opportunity around the sports. So certainly the numbers that you spoke are about cannot be imported because then it will kind of. Uh, you know, certainly uh, these are uh, numbers which are too huge. It needs to be created, and that's where the structure of sector skill council comes in. Uh, I, I would say, like you know, uh, Mr. Manmeet Singh is sitting over here from Government of India and the Sports Authority of India. As of now, we are getting almost like in different sports, almost hundred different coaches, and we are paying huge amount to them. You know, different coaches. Now, Government of India has also started focusing on junior, uh, junior level and at the uh, you know, grassroots level uh, development. So this has to come from India, not from, cannot be imported outside. So Certainly. Uh, and also about uh, the FIKI Goal Convention, which yeah. happens in uh, February 2016. Definitely. I mean, our main focus will be accessibility. I mean, one, what uh, Peter had just mentioned about the infrastructure, creation of infrastructure around, uh, you know, in sports. We do understand, I mean, because of ISL and because of under 17, there will be lots of infrastructure, but big infrastructure will be coming. But ultimately, we got to create neighborhood infrastructure, sports facilities. One is infrastructure, and then is the uh, experts at different levels in, uh, you know, for the sports. So, so certainly, I mean, uh, again, an open invitation to the gathering over here, 2016. Uh, again, my experience have been, again, you know, sp having spoken to a lot of friends uh, from various countries, that uh, India is a little too big for anybody to just come in and uh, get to know everything that they want to know in, in one go. So maybe a good chance and good opportunity for uh, everybody. And uh, quite a few people from in, the, in this room have already kind of uh, attended uh, the, the, the convention and gained uh, reasonable uh, kind of results out of it. Uh, uh, so we... we have enough time for a few questions. Uh, and before we kind of open up the floor, I would also like to mention that immediately after the session gets over, we have a very, very uh, interesting and a, and a very, very significant announcement that just happened back in New York as well as in New Delhi. And we would also like to share it with you uh, on, on the SoccerX platform. So that message would be put up as soon as the session gets over. But I would like to open up. Uh, uh, the, the floor for any questions. We might have uh, 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 time for two questions, if we can possibly. Uh, so the gentleman in the striped shirt right here, in the third row. Please identify yourself, and if you can just direct your question to one of the Hi, uh, my name is Pratinder Singh. I'm a um, sports event management specialist and uh, a football agent. As stakeholders in Indian soccer in the various forms, as an opportunity for new brands. Say a rookie wanted to come into India. We've, we've seen the success of the IPL, uh, obviously India being a cricket mad country, but we're also learning that it's a, a football mad country. And maybe that's to do with live English Premier League matches being broadcast into India for the last 10, 15 years. What opportunities are there for a, a rookie brand to go into India whether they're bringing talent or they're bringing sponsorship opportunities, where can they go to help grow their brand? Because obviously they want to engage with a potential audience of 1.2 billion people with a vast array. Where would be a good starting point for a, an overseas brand to come in and take advantage of the kind of sponsorship opportunities that uh, you've, you've mentioned? So I think it's kind of given me a, an opportunity to do a bit of self-promotion. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, uh, I, I think you're right, Tatinder. I mean, uh, somewhere or the other, uh, it, it becomes a little difficult to go out and really narrow down your focus. Uh, and for us, that story began in 2010. 
uh, knowing for sure with our collective experiences with the Federation, with sporting brands like Nike and Adidas, realize it, uh, we, we realized that there are a lot of stakeholders who essentially were talking about investing in football. They had the right kind of intent, they had the resources, and they had the vision. But what they lacked were two major things. One is lack of confidence. Those are the times when you pick up any newspaper and all you could read about uh, football was either AFF bashing or how football is not really kind of doing the right thing. Uh, and now it's pretty much changed to a lot of positivity, a lot of optimism, and a lot of uh, uh, you know, uh, clear-cut understanding in terms of what can be expected and what cannot be. So lack of confidence certainly uh, is, is a challenge for, for, for the industry. And second was lack of direction. In spite of everything being in place, you still are not going ahead because you don't have experts to go out and guide your projects. So that's why we realized that it's, it's a great opportunity to go out and one, identify these uh, groups, and trust me, with the size uh, of, of, of the country, you have many of them. While I keep on saying this, you have eight uh, franchise in ISL, you have 10 in uh, mm -hmm. I-League, uh, 11 in I-League. Uh, you have another 200 out there who certainly might have the same kind of set of resources. Uh, this week itself, uh, there are two companies which became technology partners to the biggest of the footballing brands, be it the Manu or be it the Chelsea, HCL and Wipro. So you, you have the resources out there, but when they lack that bit of direction, lack that bit of advisory, lack, lack that bit of uh, you know plan in uh, general sense, suddenly you are not able to activate those investments. So I think somewhere or there, we took it upon ourselves. We gave ourselves 1,000 days. That's the formula we follow to go out and identify and work with these kind of groups and make them progress on certain vision that they have. And once you do that, and once you have created enough success kind of stories around it, then there are more believers, and then there are more, uh, uh, you know, people who are ready to kind of, uh, you know, jump in and and, and uh, uh, kind of uh, contribute to the uh, sport. And also alongside, what happened was the the industry grew. So it was not only a few select people who were talking about why you should invest in football. There actually came about an industry. There came about a fiki. There came about the government. There came about John Abraham for that matter, who came in football and said football is good. Then we had Peter Reed coming over and said, you know, I, 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 I love what's kind of happening in this country. So I think uh, my clear-cut understanding, and again, a response to you would be, look at the thousand-day formula in India where you, any kind of uh, activities or uh, services that you might have, give it thousand days, identify your investors and your projects wisely, and those thousand days are certainly going to give you some success that you can talk about and build upon. So that pretty much kind of would be my piece of advice, having having done that in the last five years and, and uh, having kind of achieved reasonable success in that sense. Uh, we, we have, oh, okay. Hi, I'm uh, Harjit Singh from the FIFA Master Program of the Batch of 2016. Um, I've worked with a sports broadcaster in India as well. So my question comes from, or stems from uh, what the panel's already agreed on, that there is a need for incentivization of of youngsters taking up the sport. And a major hindrance to that is is the lack of earning potential from a sport like football. Cricket, yes, you have superstars who earn, you know, crores of rupees. Whereas in football, the earnings not come up, come about to that level. And what we've seen from some of the more mature leagues, say the Barclays Premier League, say La Liga, is that a lot of the money in the league comes from broadcast rights. So is there a plan in place to kind of promote uh, you know, greater earnings from the broadcast industry and make make even broadcast of football in India more, um, you know, more profitable for the broadcasters because... Uh, yeah, so, so would you want to direct it to uh, Rahul? Because if sure. he might disagree with you because <laughs> if, if you talk about the budgets uh, that he had spent on his players, money, so. he, he's <laughs> certainly going to disagree with you. No, because I'm just uh, speaking from from my experience of working with a broadcaster, and although right. the ISL is a marked improvement over the I-League, right. the, the figures, I think, of TVRs still stand at around one, as opposed to what an India-Pakistan can generate in cricket, which is at around 13 to 16, right? No, so that's not correct. India-Pakistan last time was 0.9. But anyways, <coughs> so the broadcaster, in this case, being star, is also the owner of the league. So they're making their bid. They're getting their valuation up. Uh, yes, as clubs, we're not getting the broadcasting revenues, but the kind of monies that we are paying to our players and to our domestic players is something that they have never, ever even had a dream of. Uh, I'll give you an example. A 20-year-old boy gets paid 
through auction, um, I don't know, crore rupees is what? Like a million pounds. A million pounds for three months. He's never ever thought that's the kind of money. That's the kind of money clubs have paid for a 20 year old kid just for three months. And this is just the first year, right? So you give it that time and that kind of money is gonna come into them because there is a lot of money getting out. Can, can I also add, uh, Rahul, I think uh, we are comparing apples to oranges, if you ask me. Uh, cricket, I think, I mean, uh, we built on the success in 83, and we've kind of really carried it, and it's a religion for that matter. And uh, any country would have that. If you, if you look at soccer in the United States, it's, it's uh, the inverse kind of situation that we have. But having said that, I think we've seen, uh, you know, football becoming a very decently paying career. And if you look at the other career options, be it kind of going to an Indian Institute of Technology or Indian uh, Institute of uh, management. I think if you look at the success rate for a footballer who then gives his life at the age of 10 to become a footballer when he's 20, I think the success rate and the potential of him earning a decent living out of football is a lot higher. But anyway, just we, we can we, we need to kind of take the discussion uh, uh, you know a little uh, later. We are we're pressed for time, and I'm thirdly getting very strong looks from from uh, our friends. Uh, but yes, uh, as I said, um, uh, what we are going to kind of uh, play for you now. It's actually a video about, uh, again, a very unique opportunity, a, a very unique concept that uh, was created almost 56 years back by uh, an organization called Indian Air Force. Now think about it. I never imagined that uh, a, a, a unit, a government unit like Indian Air Force would be so critical to the football development in my country. But that has happened. Uh, there's a tournament called Shubroto Cup. It essentially is under 17, under 14 level tournament, uh, which uh, engages around 600,000 uh, school kids, and uh, uh, you know there are 32,000 uh, teams that participate all across the country. So there's a uh, there's, there's a video on that particular tournament, and just following that, there's a major special announcement, which again we are very proud of. There's a very very uh, well-known legend himself who's agreed to uh, you know uh, lend his name and promote this tournament at at a global level. So we'll we'll play that video, and uh, and subsequently you'll you'll get to. Uh, hear from the legend himself what he has to say about Shubhrata Cup. So it's uh, get off the web. Yeah. Football or goalpost. Football se goalpost ka safar aasan nahi hota. Kisi ke liye bhi. नींद से रिश्ता तोड़ना पड़ता है, जुनून से जोड़ना पड़ता है, फर्क नहीं पड़ता कल कितना अच्छा खेले, कोई भी आज कल जैसा नहीं होता, हर वक्त, हर जगह, फुटबॉल खेला नहीं, जिया जाता है, फुटबॉल से गोलपोस्ट का सफर आसान नहीं होता, मेहनत लगती है, पसीना बहता है। पर खुद को बेहतर बनाने की कोशिश कम नहीं होती। आखिर फुटबॉल से गोलपोस्ट का सफर आसान कहाँ होता है? वैसे भी आसानी से मिलता ही क्या? मुकाबला जितना बड़ा हो, जीतने में उतना ही मजा आता है। हिस्सा बने हिंदुस्तान के सबसे बड़े जूनियर लेवल फुटबॉल टूर्नामेंट का सुब्रतो कप 2015 Hello, my friend. Greeting from Brazil. I want to take this opportunity to say how excited I am to return to India after almost 40 years. I look forward to attend the Subrot Cup, the largest young football tournament in Asia. I also wanted to say thank you to the Indian Air Force 
for the special invitation. They have been working very hard to support the community to grow the beautiful game. Actually, Fluminense from my county, Brazil, who won the 70 years more division last year. India is a very special country. I remember I played with in Calcutta in 77 with my team, New York Cosmos. Thank you for the invitation to be the, your guest and look forward to meeting the new generation of fans. <laughs> See you in Delhi. That's big for us. That's very, very big for us. Anyways, uh, ladies and gentlemen, while, while I get my esteemed panelists back on the stage for a, a quick photo, I also wanted to rec recognize the participation of uh, the, the members of the Indian delegation who came together and, and certainly uh, are trying to contribute to uh, the growth of Indian food. Along with uh, Rahul, we have uh, another of his counterparts from Chennai in FC, which is owned by uh, 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 Mr. Abhishek Bachchan himself. Uh, we have uh, uh, the representation from uh, Chennai in uh, right here. Uh, I've already mentioned the government of India. I've already mentioned the GFD, Goa Football Development Council. We have our friends uh, who, who have joined us uh, from various agencies. Uh, and we certainly have investors who are, who are based in uh, the United States and now looking at creating meaningful projects back in the day. So thank you, everybody. And thank you all for, for uh, being a part of uh, uh, our session. And uh, uh, we, we, sh we hope to kind of see you getting connected with India sooner or later. But, but certainly, it's, it's a market where uh, we do believe the time is now. And uh, this young sleeping giant needs to be woken up and given a little bit of kick on the backside. So uh, yeah, waiting to uh, see you all in uh, India some point or the other. Thank you so much. <laughs> so, thank